rapids. Okay. Um, can uh, everyone see those? So this Lovely. is yeah, it's okay. Yeah, this is the embedded Linux community update uh, for February of 2022. Uh, it's amazing. We're already in February and we're in the year 2022. Actually, it's been uh, quite a long time since I've given this uh, talk. Uh, so there's a lot of material that's new here. There's a couple of pages I may go over quickly. Basically, uh, just by way of reminder, the nature of this talk, this is just a quick overview of lots of different embedded topics. And uh, it's intended to be a springboard for further research. Um, so that you, if you see something interesting, you have a link or you have like a name that you can search for uh, to go look up more information. There's lots of links inside this presentation. Um, and uh, uh, the PDF should be on the website. If, if there's any problems downloading it, let me know and I will try to see what's going on with the wiki. Um, there is a little bit of over material overlap with some of the material uh, because this covers a whole year. I believe the last time I gave this uh, update was in May. So there's a little bit of material from, uh, from March and April of last year, but not a lot. Um, and again, this is not comprehensive. Uh, this is just a lot of stuff that I saw on different news sites and just uh, in working with uh, different open source communities. So uh, I will go through the Linux kernel technology areas, talk a little bit about conferences and some industry news, and then give a list of resources. So let's start with the Linux kernel. Um, and I've broken this down into a couple of different areas. I'll talk about the versions first, and I'll, I'll cover quite a bit of material, kind of new features relevant to embedded that have gone into the versions. And then I'll talk about some stuff that's in progress and give a little bit of the development stats and then tools and workflow. So the Linux kernel versions uh, vary consistently, either nine or 10 weeks. Uh, so 512 kernel was last April, and it took about 70 days for that one. Most of the time, it takes about six, uh, nine weeks to go through the, the kernel uh, release cycle. It's usually about two weeks of, of uh, merge window, followed by seven or eight weeks of um, release candidates. So that's testing. So I had 5.13 in June, 5.14 in August. And then October, it happened to land. October landed on a Sunday this year. So uh, that was actually Halloween, the last day of Actel. October. So that the release name for that one was Trick or Treat, which is a phrase used for Halloween. Uh, and then uh, the most recent uh, full kernel released uh, or you know completed kernel is 5.16 was just in January, uh, about three weeks ago. Um, and then we are currently on Linux 5.17 RC2. That's the current version this week. Uh, if we have a 63 week 63 day cycle, uh, we expect that the 5.17 will be released on uh, March 13th. So just a couple of weeks from now. Um, so just going back in time a little bit and uh, I'll talk about what kind of embedded things, embedded related things have appeared in the different kernels. It's actually each kernel only has a couple of things that I would say are are really relevant to embedded. There's a, obviously a whole lot of drivers that get added and and support for different hardware. Uh, but in terms of core features uh, that are relevant to embedded, there's a lot of stuff, of course, that goes on uh, into the kernel for uh, enterprise and uh, server software. Uh, but these are some of the things that I thought might be interesting for uh, embedded. So uh, support for OProfile was removed in 5.12. This is superseded by perf events. Uh, there's a new feature called uh, or new command line option called preempt dynamic uh, that allows you to select the preemption mode either at boot or actually even at runtime. So it's not just a kernel command line option. It's I think there's a must be a sys control or a proc or a sys knob. Um, there's dynamic thermal power management, which allows power usage of groups and devices uh, to be capped to meet thermal constraints. So this has to do with power management. And in particular, th this is the first time I've seen it uh, related specifically to thermal issues. So controlling power not for 
power savings, but in order to control the heat of the device. And then uh, Nintendo 64 was support was added to this kernel. So that's really neat if you happen to have a Nintendo 64 and you want to run Linux on it. Uh, not sure how useful that is, but uh, but there you go. You we, Linux, you can run it on a on an N64 box. Other things in the 5.12 kernel, uh, build systems can use Clang's link time optimization features on ARM and x86 ARM64 and x86 architectures. Kfence memory debugging tool was added. Uh, there are a lot of perf events uh, features added. So there's tools uh, related to the perf command line tool. You can report on instruction latency. Um, and now it's got a, a daemon mode. Uh, so that you can do really long running sessions, put it in the background. And then uh, from Sony's standpoint, we had support for PlayStation DualSense game controller. So that's a driver. I usually don't cover driver ones, but it's kind of cool to see a Sony driver get into the kernel. Uh, in June, so kind of starting uh, last summer, we had support for control flow integrity. And I'm, I'll talk about that a little bit later. That's a kernel hardening thing for security. Uh, we also have the software interrupt processing code from the preempt RT patch set uh, was mainlined. So this is a, a big chunk of preempt RT patch that was mainlined. And I'll talk about that also when I talk about real time. Uh, the log buff lock, which was used by printk, has been removed. Uh, people are working towards, the developers are working towards a lockless printk, uh, which should uh, make it, give it better performance and uh, it gives it good attributes when you're when you're uh, trying to emit messages about a, a hang or an oops. Uh, support for the generic US, USB display driver um, and BPF programs can now call some kernel functions directly. Uh, that was not allowed in the past. Uh, Dev KMEM uh, was removed from from this kernel. That's uh, a long long standing uh, interface into kernel memory. It's, long been uh, deemed a security risk, so that was actually removed. It's a very, uh, very rare instance of something that was deprecated, uh, actual interface into user space that was deprecated by the kernel developers. Uh, we added a new uh, WAN networking features, um, and networking framework rather, and then the landlocked security module. In Linux 5.14, uh, there's something called memfd secret system call. A new system call was added, and I'll talk about that next. A couple of new tracers, one called OS noise and another one called timer lat or timer late. Uh, uh, OS noise to show application delays caused by kernel activity and the timer latency or timer late uh, is stands for timer latency, detailed inform information about timer based wakeups. And then I happen to notice in this release, uh, normally I don't go through individual kind of uh, drivers and contributions because there's so many of them, but there was a lot of Qualcomm and MediaTek driver code. And of course, I'm, I've always been interested in that because I used to work with those uh, processors on some of Sony's products. But uh, a lot of stuff for clocks, uh, pin controllers, and sound uh, for those uh, CPUs. Uh, something called the simple DRM driver was added in 5.14. And this is a DRM driver uh, that runs on top of simple legacy frame buffer devices. So if you have an old frame buffer device, uh, uh, you can now use a DRM style driver for that. And then uh, KUnit tests can run tests under QEMU. Uh, and so it's always been possible to run tests KUnit natively or uh, on in user mode Linux. Uh, but now you can do it uh, under QEMU. So that's uh, that's kind of a nice addition to expand the places you can test. So I wanted to go back and talk about the memfd secret system call. This creates a region of memory that even the kernel cannot directly access. So uh, the pages are actually removed from the kernel's page map. Uh, so the kernel does not have access to the pages. This is Normally, the kernel can see everything in physical memory, but uh, this is removed from the kernel's map. Um, and this is intended for use for cryptographic keys. So if you have a user space process that's managing uh, cryptographic information, uh, then it can hide it even from the kernel. So of course, it 
Okay, so this makes it difficult for other processes to unintentionally or even in, to intentionally access the memory. So if you are inside the kernel and you are specifically, I mean, you have the capability to remap the pages and um, and access the memory. So it's not it's not a hundred percent guarantee that the kernel can't access the memory, but it makes it so that uh, the type of code that is that is usually injected into the kernel kernel due to a security vulnerability would have to do multiple steps to be able to access the memory. So it does doesn't make it so that if the kernel is compromised uh, through some ver vulnerability, it's still quite difficult for the compromised code to get access to those keys. Uh, so this is actually a pretty nice, uh, pretty nice security feature for the kernel. In Linux 5.15, uh, this is coming up in October, so not that long ago really, we had uh, the real-time preemption locking code, or this is also known as sleeping spin locks. Uh, this was added to 5.15 kernel, and this is a big deal. This is pretty, well, I'll, I'll talk about this when I get to real-time, but this is pretty much the last big section of the real-time preempt code. Uh, to get mainlined. Uh, so there are more IOU ring performance enhancements, something called uh, BIO recycling. I think that st stands for block IO recycling. Um, and then the there's an uh, interesting one. So core scheduler support for asymmetric systems. So uh, for a long time, um, things like phones uh, or other embedded products have had uh, ace, well, Asymmetric uh, processors, but in the so the, you probably heard of something called Big Dot Little, which allowed the kernel to to handle processors that had different uh, performance characteristics. But usually on a Big Dot Little system, uh, even though the processors had different performance, they could execute the same instruction set. Uh, in this case, uh, this is this is talking about uh, true support for asymmetric systems where the where there are cores on the same chip, this is for ARM, that can either run 64-bit code or 32-bit code, but not both. So uh, the instruction sets are actually different in what they can handle. Um, and that turns out to be uh, an interesting problem um, that was solved. Well, I don't know if it was 100% solved, or, or but the core scheduler was support was added for this. Um, and then uh, also, I thought it was really interesting, uh, KSMBD, which is an in-kernel uh, SMB server. So SMB is the uh, network protocol that's used to talk to Windows machines. And, when, and there's actually a lot of uh, storage products that also provide SMB servers. Uh, so this is not a full replacement for Samba. Samba is the open source project that does uh, SMB servers in user space. Uh, and so there are a bunch of other tools, user space tools that are required to, to use this. But in some cases, some situations, having an in-kernel server provides better optimization. So this is uh, actually pretty interesting. And I didn't, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't know if they, uh, if the kernel would, uh, if this would get accepted. Uh, I know that there were, there were tries in the early days of the web to try and put HTTP servers in the kernel uh, for performance reasons, and they were never except. Well, some got in for a little while, but then got kicked back out. Uh, but that's interesting. The other things in 5.15 are print K indexing, uh, where you can extract all the print K messages from the kernel. Uh, this is used to detect changes that can break log parsing tools. So there's a lot of uh, kind of automated tools that watch the kernel messages and use that to detect when certain things go go wrong. So they're kind of hard coded to look for uh, specific kernel messages. And so what happens is over time as the developers, they're not aware of, of what messages are like kind of keyed on by by external tools. And so they might get changed as you know, people will just change the message, not thinking it's a big problem. But this this uh, print K indexing feature allows for uh, the kernel or uh, uh, an administrator to extract all of the print K messages out of the kernel and then compare them with a canned list or like you could do a delta with the last version of the kernel you were running and see which messages have changed. And that allows you to to detect if any of your log parsing tools are, are going to miss messages that are important. So that's actually a pretty nice feature. 
Um, there's a new uh, ac access monitoring tool called Daemon, uh, and that system was merged. I'll, I have some details about that on the next page. Um, and then uh, this was a pretty big change. The kernel now uses the dash W error flag during build by default. So any any warnings that are emitted by the code will get turned into errors and they will cause the build to fail. So that means that uh, the kernel needs to build cleanly now. So there's a uh, it's now kind of a requirement. I mean, you can work. There are ways to work around it. You can. I think you can turn this option off. But uh, by default, uh, when developers are compiling the kernel, if they haven't changed any of the default settings, then uh, any warnings will cause the build to fail. And hopefully, that will help developers find new issues and go fix them before they make it very far in the development cycle. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, and then. Uh, if LLVM equals one, uh, th and this is, I think, the environment variable used for during kernel build or a make variable, you don't need to specify cross compile. So that's interesting that uh, I'll, for years and years, in order to cross compile a kernel, you've had to specify this cross compile variable. But now that LLVM is supported, it doesn't actually need that. LLVM uh, determines the uh, um, architecture and and the parameters for the tool chain a different way uh, so that's uh, that's going to take a little bit of getting used to um, and then they also changed it so that this kernel now requ uh, requires as of version 5.15 it requires gcc version 5.1 so older versions of gcc are no longer supported um, so if you're using a super old version of gcc you may want to check into that so let me talk about the data access monitoring tool um, that was included in this release. Uh, this provides a tool to record data access and show visualizations of access patterns. So this is actually pretty cool. I should have included a picture of one of the heat maps that they had. So they can show a heat map of the memory accesses for a particular workload. So you run a program, you, you start recording the memory accesses, um, and then you um, and then you run your workload, you know, if it's a database or if it's web program or whatever it is. Um, and then you can, there's, you save that data set just like any other kind of tracing thing. But this is for data accesses. Uh, and you can get graphs showing information about the working set size for a program, which is really handy, or a heat map of the memory accesses. So you can see if you have um, particular areas of your memory that are very hot. Um, and you can actually find out if you have areas of your memory that are really cold, which means they're not getting access very frequently. And so you can actually use that to restructure your program or change your workload. Uh, and this is a pretty nice diagnostic tool. Uh, but is it actually more than that? And I will talk about that in 5.16. So um, in 5.16, and this is just the latest kernel. So this was just released in January, I think January 9th. We have the enhanced read-only file system uh, continues to get some new features. So this is used, uh, I think Huawei introduced this file system. It's It supports compression of read-only files, read-only data. Um, and it's useful in, uh, in embedded devices for certain things. Uh, and I believe Huawei is using it on their Android phones. But uh, this has multiple device support. Uh, uh, in terms of security, IOU ring operations can now have security policies, policies enforced either by SE Linux or SMAC. And we had the first set of patches for folios, and that's a new memory data type that I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but then we have a second set of patches for uh, the daemon uh, system. So I thought that daemon was just going to be data monitoring, so it's just going to be like a debug or tracing tool. But this set of patches added something called operation schemes, and it actually allows you to perform proactive page reclaim. OK, so what does that mean? That means that uh, it can, based on the pattern of accesses it's seeing in the, in the data, in the working set of a program, it will go out and actually, for the cold areas of, of uh, the working set, It'll it'll go reclaim those pages, uh, and so that means that uh, even before the system runs out of memory, 
uh, then pages are getting swapped out from a from a process. So it's, uh, I mean, there's page reclaim automatically uh, through some of the other mechanisms in the kernel, but this is like proactively. This is looking at kind of the pattern and doing it from user space. So the data is collected in kernel space, but the the proactive page reclaim is being triggered by algorithms in in user space. Um, and so that's uh, that's pretty interesting. And the the guy that submitted it. Uh, said that in certain workloads it actually has a has a pretty nice effect on overall memory performance. So that's pretty good. Um, so in Linux 5.17, I actually found very little stuff in this one. Uh, this is the first one I started with when I started looking back and I, gosh, there wasn't a whole lot of interesting stuff for embedded in this one, but oh well. Uh, a couple of things that might be interesting, uh, the ram random number generating, Generator uses a hash function as part of uh, as part of its operation, and for years it's been using something called SHA-1. Uh, that is replaced with kind of a more modern uh, hash function called Blake-2, which is faster, and I think it's also supposed to be more secure. Uh, so it's producing better rendered numbers. Uh, the results that I saw showed a 370% increase in random number generation performance. So that's pretty cool. It's amazing to me. I'm always amazed that the uh, kernel developers can can find new ways to increase performance on stuff that's been around for years. Um, the real-time Linux analysis tools, so there's RTLA tools have been added, and they added uh, OS noise and timer lat, which are the same ones that, that were added in 5.15 as kind of, um, I think, F trace traces. So I'm not sure if this is just a, a wrapper over those or if this is somehow different, but this, this added some C code. <laughs> so set of, there's a set of real-time tools uh, for running those tracers and, and reporting information, uh, well, help, hopefully related to real-time analysis. Um, and then uh, it's one thing to be careful of. This is, I know uh, FUSE, file, file system in user space, is used a lot in embedded products. Uh, there were some changes to the flag fields used in the Fuse init call. That's one of the weird ioctals for, or I don't know if it's a syscall or an ioctal or on one of the syscalls. Anyway, but check your Fuse file system and tools and make sure they're still compatible because there was some concern about this when these changes were accepted. Um, so uh, a couple of things in progress. Uh, one of these I talked about before, but uh, the page folios, but just some other things. These are these are patch sets that have not been accepted into the kernel, uh, but work is ongoing on them. So one of them is called folios. Uh, this is a new data type, really. It's it's a pointer to a page, but it's a the the structure definition of it is different. Uh, basically, it's, it indicates that a pointer to a page that is not the tail of a compound page. And so I can't get into all of the details of this, but basically this is an internal typing improvement. So as the kernel is using these pointers, it actually has compiler assistance to know when it's dealing with uh, something that's uh, the head of a compound page or the middle of a compound page or the last page is called the tail page. And the reason for that is that there are some functions in the kernel that don't work correctly if they're called with tail pages. Um, and so this helps resolve some of the issues with that. So you don't want to send, uh, have a routine that's hand, uh, handling a page with the wrong attributes. So some kernel devs like this patch set and some don't, but it seems moot now because uh, the code was adopted in 5.16 and 5.17. Well, here's the thing. The code was adopted for some of the allocation routines and some of the page handling routines, but so far, I don't think I don't think uh, like drivers are actually passing in folios instead of page pointers yet. So this is still not actually used yet. So we haven't we can't, haven't seen the kind of the fallout from this big change. It is a fairly big change uh, to the memory allocation stuff in the kernel. But that's something that's on the horizon. That's something that's coming. Uh, another thing that's uh, uh, coming is multi-generational LRU. So LRU is least recently used. So uh, this is the system in the kernel that manages page eviction. 
So currently there are two queues for managing page eviction. You have an active uh, queue and an inactive queue. And of course, the ones on the inactive queue are the ones that as they age, uh, they're candidates for being evicted. So you can load hotter pages into memory. Um, but uh, the MGLRU uh, system proposes multiple queues and has a, obviously a more complex algorithm. Supposedly, this provides less, this uses less CPU overhead than the 2Q system, um, and it does much better at working set estimation. And it also allows for uh, proactive reclaim. So that's like the second time in the, in the presentation we've talked about proactive reclaim. I guess that is an important topic. There was a big debate about, it, about whether it could be merged in 5.17. So I think the patches were submitted to be merged in 5.17, but it, it didn't, it did not pass uh, the hurdles, um, but it does have supporters. Uh, a lot of people came out and said, well, we're already using, you know, so people already had the patches. Uh, Google said that they've been using it and it's working well on Android phones and in Chrome, in the Chrome, uh, Chrome OS. So um, I think this one's probably going to get in um, and it, it's a, an improvement again with dealing with memory, uh, particularly memory pressure. Uh, so Rust for the Linux kernel. So people have been trying to uh, make a system that supports putting Rust code in the Linux kernel so they can write drivers in Rust instead of C. This is very controversial, uh, but the work continues. It wasn't immediately kind of shot down uh, by Linus and others. And so the third version of the Rust support patch was posted in January. Um, this is uh, adding Rust code to the kernel is actually very difficult. Uh, in fact, a lot of people are kind of wondering how it could be done at all. Uh, you, one of the issues that they faced is that um, Rust apparent, in Rust, apparently a memory allocation can't fail. Uh, and so how you square that with the kernel memory allocation that can fail uh, is, uh, is kind of a tough problem. So they had to do a ma modified memory allocator inside Rust that can fail, and I'm not sure how, how that all works with Rust's memory safety guarantees. Uh, there are lots of features that are still unstable, so this one is uh, probably still quite a ways off. None of this has been accepted in the kernel yet, but the interesting thing is the work is proceeding, and so we'll see what happens. Uh, the last kind of uh, in-progress patch I want to talk about is zero-copy networking. So IOU ring seems to be swallowing up all of the world in terms of its, uh, uh, if people are trying to do performant uh, input output IO with the kernel, uh, they doing it through IOU ring. Um, and so there is an RFC request for comments patch by Pavel Bagunkov. Um, and uh, he is showing that his zero copy networking uh, is uh, one one and a half to two times faster than the current socket based zero copy networking. So zero copying is when you can perform the I/O without having to transfer the data, uh, you know, to copy the memory multiple times. Uh, and particularly in networking, this is a little bit tricky. And there were some socket based calls that did this already, but this is even faster. So again, an example of the kernel getting faster. So just really quickly through some development stats, uh, this is not super critical, but Michael uh, Strausa uh, or Straub uh, worked on a wireless driver, had 286 chain sets in one release. That's that's a lot. Uh, Christoph Helwig, he always shows up in the top five. Uh, he's just all over the place. Uh, in terms of lines changed, uh, Ping K. Shi uh, submitted, uh, I guess, uh, 91,000 lines of code. Uh, this is one of those things where the driver probably got uh, developed out of tree and then submitted all at once, uh, but this driver skipped the staging tree, so that was that was kind of interesting. But it's a, it represented 11% of an entire release was just this one driver. Um, in terms of active employers or the companies that are employing people, so Intel's at the top, Google and Red Hat. That, there's no surprise there. Unknown is always a category uh, a, a category of uh, employers that's high. Unknown is when we don't know who the employer is. You can't you can't tell from the email address, and uh, the the number of developers in that category was about 400. So a lot of developers are unknown. We don't know we don't know what company they work for. It's not like 
we, we know who they are. They have names and email addresses, but we don't know what company they work for. And a lot of these uh, people who are kind of independents are, uh, some are drive-by contributors. Uh, they're mostly submitting just one or two patches. So they're just submitting a kernel a fix here or there, or, you know, some tweak. Uh, some, some are drive-by and some will stay around. So that's just kind of an interesting thing. And then in terms of the size of each of the kernels, this is just a git log count, which is, maybe is a poor proxy for the total size. But uh, 5.13 was kind of a larger kernel and had a larger number of developers working on it. Um, the numbers at the bottom for 5.17 RC2, uh, we still have uh, you know four or five uh, or possibly even six more uh, development um, releases or release candidates. So that number hasn't settled down, but it looks like it's a little bit smaller release than we've had. But that doesn't really matter. It just things land when they land. Um, OK, so now in terms of kernel development, I want to talk about lore and lay, uh, and then using GitHub for kernel work. So lore is an archive of all of the different kernel mailing lists, and this has become an indispensable tool for kernel developers. And you can actually go out and look at it there. So it used to be that you would go out and look at lkml.org to if you wanted to go look up kernel messages. But these are, lore is actually, uh, does more than just one mailing list. It's all of the mailing lists. And it has some really nice attributes. It's very structured, and they've put search engines on it um, so that you can do smart searches over all of the repositories. And they have special context qualifiers so that you can search for data in a much smarter way than you could with just a regular uh, search engine. I mean, the, the qualifiers are specific to the types of things you'd want to use for searching kernel developer related emails you know they know what a patch is they know what the hunks look like and what that means so uh, some of the qualifiers you can match the subject line you can quote you can match the non-quoted portion of the text which is really handy if you've ever tried to search for stuff with google in a mailing list uh, you always get matches against the quoted portions and that's not you usually want to go back to you know who is the first person who said this and you know you don't want to see the quoted portion uh, match but you can match the file names, you can match the hunk headers, which is usually function names. And then if you combine that, all that goodness, with uh, something called LEI or local email interface, this is a tool that will perform one of those searches and then create a local mailbox uh, with the results. And so why is that handy? So it's great for kernel developers. So kernel developers have, have long had this problem that they have to subscribe to a bunch of different lists and it just is overwhelming. They just have tons of emails. So this allows them to avoid subscribing to email lists and still catch the items of interest, no matter which list it appears on. So developer can create a query for items of interest. Uh, and uh, so, it does take a little bit of setup. You have to learn the tool and you have to make sure that your queries are kind of appropriate and good. Uh, but uh, LA can remember the query uh, so you can issue it again really easily. And then I'll show you an example query. But the big thing is that because it, it once it finds all those results, it creates a local mailbox and you can use that mailbox offline and you can use familiar mail tools. So it's kind of like you've got a, a custom mail folder uh, that just has the items of search interest right at your fingertips for just the stuff you're interested in. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, way of a way like a maintainer can create their own kind of virtual uh, mailing list that they subscribe to, which just has the stuff they, they're interested in. So just by way of example, here's a query uh, that a floppy driver maintainer might use. And I will not go, uh, you can read all this uh, offline, but basically this is a this is a query that would that would create a local mailbox called Mail Floppy that would have uh, that would find all of the emails that touch floppy.c uh, that change a function whose name starts with uh, floppy underscore or that have floppy in the subject line or that mention floppy and either bug or regression uh, somewhere in the text of the message um, and were received in the last month. So that is a very specific set of uh, attributes 
but it's just the type of thing a floppy ma driver maintainer would like to see. No matter which list it occurs on, you'd like to collect those emails, and then you could you could operate on them. So, very very interesting and useful tool. Uh, the other thing that's been going on is that uh, there's a guy, Konstantin Ryabitsev. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. Is working on a bot that can turn a GitHub pull request into a email patch series. And the idea is that this would allow a developer who's using GitHub to submit a patch. So um, we've talked for years about the difficulty of setting up an email-based workflow to work as a kernel developer, and this gets around it uh, entirely. So it handles things like running patch, check patch and get maintainers. You can add other things to the CI, um, the CI uh, sort of continuous integration uh, steps as part of your submission. Um, so some maintainers think this is a great idea, and some maintainers uh, are not real too happy about this. They don't want people to be able to just submit stuff uh, through GitHub. Uh, the, what happens, though, is it doesn't actually affect the maintainer's <coughs> workflow because the maintainer sees, the, sees them as emails. They just show up as emails. Uh, and so from the maintainer's perspective, there it's transparent. They, they don't know that it was submitted from GitHub versus submitted from someone using Git send mail. Uh, but they don't think that GitHub promotes desirable practices. So for instance, uh, in GitHub, there's no way to review commit messages. And so they think that uh, GitHub users are kind of poor at writing commit messages for that reason. But that, uh, I don't know. I don't think that's a very valid argument. Uh, Email, your proficiency with email should not be a hurdle to whether or not you can contribute to the Linux kernel. Uh, so this is interesting work, I think. OK, so now uh, let me talk about technology areas. And I may have to pick up the pace here a little bit. But um, so these are the areas I'm going to talk about. And I'll go through them pretty quickly. Some of this is duplicate, so I won't spend a lot of time. But uh, Pipewire is new audio. Uh, API or a system uh, that is intended to replace Pulse Audio and Jack and has higher performance. Uh, there is a talk by George uh, Kiagiadakis uh, from Colabara at the ELC 2021, and he talked about um, how to use it. And uh, especially, there's a new new tool called Wire Plumber, which is the session manager for Pipewire. So a lot of these uh, video and audio codec things. Um, have different ways of, you know, you you create pipelines of processors. And uh, in this case, this is scriptable in a language called Lua. Um, and you can mix and match kind of your, your audio uh, pipeline elements uh, pretty easily with this. And so that's, that's kind of work going on there. In terms of the core kernel, uh, I already talked about all of these, um, MFD secret, Pre-K indexing, asymmetrics, processor scheduling, and RNG speedups. So I don't have a lot of stuff new here. In terms of uh, same thing here, uh, in terms of file systems, uh, all of these are recovered uh, in the the kernel version slides. But IOU <coughs> ring, if you haven't started using IOU ring, if you, if you're doing high performance file system stuff or high performance networking, you probably want to start checking out IOU ring. So the the basic thing about it is that it allows you to do multiple IO operations without having to do syscalls, right? So you set up your buffer in user space, and then you put your operations in that buffer. And the kernel can process them sequentially without having to do that kernel to user transition due to syscalls. Uh, anyway, there are performance enhancements, uh, security regulation, um, and support for zero copy networking is coming. Uh, AeroFS. And F2FS continue to mature. So these are these both of these are file systems that are heavily used uh, in Android phones. And you see continuing features, better compression support, and ex uh, extended attribute support. And then I talked about the FUSE and it flag changes. In terms of graphics, uh, we have the generic USB display driver. So I mentioned this, and I think I talked about it last time. But basically, this allows you to push graphics and video over USB. Um, and so that's actually pretty cool. Uh, you can turn a Raspberry Pi Zero, so even a really small, cheap device, like a $5 device, uh, you can turn that into a USB to HDMI adapter. 
Um, the simple DRM driver was merged in 5.14. And then uh, there was uh, a bit of a kerfluffle. Uh, I don't know if, uh, I don't think that there's a word for that in Japanese, but there was a, a, a controversy over uh, FB dev system. So it got a maintainer, uh, but some people didn't like it, which is odd. So a new maintainer called Helge Deller uh, wanted to come in and uh, the status of the legacy uh, frame buffer uh, device code, this is frame buffer uh, device code, so this is graphics code. Uh, it was listed as orphan in the maintainer's file. And so he submitted a patch saying, well, I'll take it over. I'm, I'm willing to work on it. And uh, it got changed and then he started, he started changing patches. Uh, or at least discussing changing patches on the mailing list. And there was some construct, uh, it was, it all happened kind of too quickly without, I think there was only a two day window between when his patch was submitted and he got accepted as the maintainer. And there was, uh, the, one of the very first things he did was uh, revert a patch from some of the DRM maintainers uh, because uh, having to do with hardware acceleration for 2D scrolling. Um, and so the DRM maintainers are like, hey, what the heck are you doing? You're taking our patches out. And uh, he's saying, well, they break a bunch of devices. They, he, he, his assertion was it broke like uh, 37 old legacy devices. Um, quite frank, there was a big blow up on the mailing list. Well, it wasn't huge. It was you know maybe 20 or 30 messages, but people got involved in the discussion. Uh, it looked to me like just the DRM dev developers got their kind of feelings hurt and uh, over something they weren't even maintaining that well. Um, but anyway, my opinion, I, I think they should let the new maintainer try to, uh, if someone wants to step up and actually maintain code, well, let him try it and see if what he does is messed up or not. So before you complain, anyway, that was that in terms of languages, I want to talk a little bit about Rust and Python, uh, just because, uh, they were in the news a little bit. So I saw this really interesting thing. Well, REST is already, uh, people know that it's being applied to security sensitive tools because it has better memory safety than C. Um, but I saw a REST version of GNU core utils. I thought that was really interesting. So people are actually going back and uh, looking at some of these uh, utilities that uh, are not, I don't think core utils is, is perceived as being particularly uh, uh, having a lot of security vulnerabilities. Of course, you never know. I mean, sometimes things show up 10, 20 years later that you has a security vulnerability that you didn't realize. But anyway, work is progressing on on this. And the interesting thing is it does not have a GPL license, it has an MIT license. So that is uh, pretty interesting to be able to take a component that was GPL that might have security vulnerabilities and replace it with something that's MIT that does not have security vulnerabilities. Sounds like a win on two, two sides. Uh, and then Rust in the kernel, I already talked about this basically. Um, memory safety features of Rust are kind of desirable, uh, but the reaction of kernel developers is very mixed. So kernel developers are still kind of have a wait and see attitude. Uh, they don't want to require de kernel developers to know more languages. Hard enough, you have to know, you really kind of have to know at least C and the kind of the kernel variant of C. There's a lot of things to know there. Um, and assembly, uh, adding Rust to the mix would would really raise the the barrier to new developers in the kernel. Not sure the benefit is worth the cost, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens with it. Uh, people are still working on it, and so uh, maybe it'll get in someday. In terms of Python, uh, so this is I just throw this in there because I do a lot of my work in Python uh, in the test automation space. Uh, some distros have actually started to disable Python 2 by default. So SUSE, latest version of SUSE, uh, actually has Python 2 disabled. You know, Python 2 is ostensibly like 10 years old. You're not supposed to use it, but I still have programs that I haven't converted over. So, I, you know, so I would guess they wouldn't run on SUSE. Um, C Python is getting faster. Uh, there's still a lot of work, and this is in the Python 3 space. And so everybody says, well, just convert to Python 3, but there's there's a whole bunch of problems. So Python 3.10 was released October 4th, so we're already on the 10th iteration of Python uh, with all of those features, better error messages, debugging, et cetera. But um, my big issue is everything I, every, every program I've converted to Python 3, uh, the Python 3 has met, 
community has managed to break by removing deprecated functions or or syntax. And so they just keep breaking backwards compatibility. So it's really a, it's really a bummer that uh, the distros ha are starting to disable Python 2, and yet the Python 3 is breaking all the time. So um, developers just can't seem to leave the language alone. That's just my pet peeve, I guess. I'll just have to live with it. Uh, in terms of networking, I think I already talked about this. Uh, wireless WAN framework was added to the kernel in 5.13. This is also known as mobile broadband. Basically, it's wireless. Um, uh, it's it's just cellular modems, right? So this is uh, you you can now do uh, networking directly to cellular modems in in the Linux kernel. Uh, so that's obviously good for phones. Um, and then with networking, I didn't have a bunch of other stuff. Uh, nothing really stood out as being specific to embedded. A lot of this stuff is really kind of has to do with um, uh, server-based networking or routers. I mean, I guess network uh, a lot. There are a lot of uh, routers that are using embedded Linux. So in that to that degree, these are might be important for that. But there's just a whole stream. I'm not going to read through them all even. Just a bunch of different things that have been going on. And there's even more than this. This is just a partial list, kind of the highlights <clears throat> over the last year. A bunch of stuff has happened in networking. Um, now, real time. Real time is pretty exciting. So I talked about preamp dynamic. Uh, that allows you to select the preemption mode at boot time or at runtime. So you can actually uh, have a kernel that has preempt RT uh, compiled in, and then you can switch it between real preempt RT on or off, uh, and there's actually another uh, level called voluntary. Um, and so there's an option under debug FS for controlling that at runtime. And then the real-time analysis tools, and then the preempt RT status. So in 5.13, uh, well, just in the last year, actually since last summer, we've gotten two major features of preempt RT uh, in, in, into, mainlined into the Linux kernel. So we've got the software interrupt-based uh, processing, and we got sleeping spin locks, and this is this is uh, recent. I mean, sleeping spin locks just went in in January, so just a couple of weeks ago. Well, I mean, they were the merge window in December or October or whatever. Um, but okay, so what is the what is the sleeping spin locks? So um, normally, a spin lock uh, for a spin lock, you uh, actually spin, which means you sit there and consume CPU cycles waiting for a lock to clear. Um, this this attribute of uh, preempt RT allows the process to switch while that lock is held. So it converts it from a split from you know a spin lock into something different. Um, and this is probably the core feature of preempt RT. This is the the core, mechanism that allows preempt RT to give uh, real-time performance, uh, real-time features in the kernel. So you have to turn config preempt RT on in order to use this. Uh, however, uh, the developer, Thomas Glaxner, has said that it's been extensively tested <coughs> to verify that uh, <coughs> if you are if you don't turn that next option on, it has no effect whatsoever. So they've tried really, really hard to restrict the, so there's no performance degradation if you don't use this feature, uh, in particular if it's compiled out. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this was merged in uh, 5.15 after 17 years of development effort. So preempt RT wow. is seven years old. So that is a pretty major, pretty major thing. So what's left? Uh, everybody always asks as soon as this new feature gets in for preempt RT. And the last time I gave these slides, there were about 10,000 lines of code left. We're now down to about 3,000 lines of code. That's actually, that sounds like a lot, but that's only a little over 100 patches. Um, and, and that also sounds like a lot. But if, you, if you've been a maintainer before, if you've maintained a kernel, which I have for Sony, uh, 100 patches, that is nothing. Uh, that is not that much code, especially if you're trying to apply that. The the big pain point when you try to apply uh, a series of patches from an you know an external patch, a non mainline patch, is how many conflicts you hit with other patches. That's that's where the kind of the real hard work comes in. 
resolving patch conflicts. But 101 patches, that's not very many. And so, and only affecting 133 files, 3,000 3, lines of code. Um, so what's left? In that patch set, there are some big changes to print K. Uh, there are some smallish changes, me medium-sized changes, I guess, to the random number generator, the serial driver, the core scheduler has a couple of things, a couple of things for C groups and tracing and mem control and a DRM, one of the DRM drivers, but not a lot of stuff. So um, it's not a huge amount of code. And so the patch is going to be a lot easier to apply. And we're getting to the point where, uh, I mean, you could reasonably uh, run preempt RT without applying the patch at all. And you might get you might get lucky depending on your workload. You might actually it might actually work without having to apply the patch or you'd get sufficient real time performance. Uh, I would still apply the patch because now it's now it's easier to apply and it's uh, not not very intrusive. Anyway, so that's very exciting. Uh, we've been working on this for years. Well, and I say we, uh, I mean Thomas Gleixner. Um, OK, so let's move on to security. So security, we've got kernel hardening, control flow integrity and landlock security module. I'm kind of getting, uh, I got to watch my time here. I want to make sure that I leave uh, enough time for remaining things. So I'll just talk a little bit about this. So control in, in terms of hardening, we had control flow integrity, which was added in 5.13. And I think I got a couple of slides on that. Strict mem copy bounds checking was added in 5.16. And you can read about that on lwm.net. Um, basically making sure that um, when a mem copy is done by the kernel is done within bounds. That's one of the ways that uh, that vulnerabilities are used when people find a way to tweak tweak the kernel and make it do something uh, that's incorrect. It you it often involves having mem copy copy stuff where it shouldn't, and so do, that bounds checking is actually pretty helpful uh, to mitigate vulnerabilities. And then there is always a stream of uh, specter mitigations. So specter it refers to speculative execution. Uh, and there's a whole class of them uh, about, was it two years ago, three years ago, when, when specter and meltdown came out. Uh, and so we're still adding mitigations for that class of uh, errors. <clears throat> so one thing I found really interesting, though, is uh, for the first time, I saw someone go remove some specter mitigation behavior. Oh, behavior spelled wrong, but um, in 5.16, someone removed some uh, some of this mitigations. They said it's overhead and it really wasn't buying extra security. So that's the first time I've seen that. But every every kernel release, it seems like there's a couple more kind of new tools or methods or functions or mechanisms to to try to prevent. Uh, speculative execution vulnerability. Um, so control flow integrity. I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna uh, gonna skip over this because I I talked about this the last time I gave this presentation. Uh, but basically, well, I'll, I'll give the very quick. <clears throat> so CFI checks that an indirect function call uh, goes to a function with the same signature, right? So it checks uh, the other thing that that kernel vulnerabilities, well, or kernel exploits will try to do is they will try to get you to jump to the wrong place. And so CFI protects that. Uh, it detects if the destination site has been changed. Um, and there are thousands of indirect calls in the kernel. Um, and so there are, there are lots of different types of CFI, control flow integrity mechanisms. Uh, this one that was merged in 5.13 is referred to forward edge CFI. Um, this requires uh, link time optimization. Um, and so it is uh, it is pretty intense. Uh, it requires that the compiler be able to analyze all of the code at once. Uh, usually uh, the compiler is just analyzing the code a module at a time. Um, and of course, this requires extra checking at execution time. And so, but it, it it does incur some overhead, but it's claimed that it incurs less than 1% overhead. So we have ARM64 support now, and x86 support is in the work. A couple of other security bits. <clears throat> um, the landlock security module, and I really am going to skip over that one. I don't think I need to talk too much about that one because um, I, I covered it before. But the pull kit vulnerability fix, that is new. 
That is an in-progress patch to prevent uh, processes from being executed with no uh, with no ar arguments to them. So there's a part of the start of a process is passing it its argument list and its environment. And uh, I will and uh, usually that is managed by user space, but the kernel does have uh, have a hand in that. And uh, there's been a really nasty uh, security vulnerability just detected uh, like a couple of weeks ago. Um, well, it was uh, advertised a couple of weeks ago. I don't know how long it's been known about, uh, but it's an old vulnerability. Vulnerability has been there for over 12 years. Anyway, I'll talk about that later when I go through other security stuff. OK, this is the landlocked security module. This is a new security module that can uh, do additional validation. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about it. So you can go look at uh, look at this LWM.net article to kind of read more about it. Um, OK, so testing. Uh, we are getting through the technology areas, and I want to make sure we have time for some of the other things I want to talk about. So uh, there are test systems, and I'll just a couple of real quick notes on some of the different test systems, what they're up to. Kernel CAI just recently added the KSELF test git repo to the list of trees it tests. This is a long time coming. I don't know why this hasn't happened sooner. This is not so much to test uh, what KSELF test tests, OK, if that makes sense. This, this is not a test of the kernel as much as it is a test of KSELF test. So you'll get the compilation testing and you'll you know you'll get on multiple architectures you can see if k self test actually compiles and runs uh, it's not to actually get the results for those kernels uh, well it may in the future but uh, sysbot is always producing more fuzzing failure cases uh, continues to churn out uh, more failure areas in the kernel faster than they can be fixed um, and maybe maybe that will change in the future but it's just it keeps finding all kinds of uh, bugs uh, CKI is also, which is Red Hat's uh, continuous kernel uh, integration system, and they, they, I've seen a lot of reports from them lately to upstream, and a lot of reports from LKFT to upstream. So there's uh, a lot of automated testing happening on the upstream kernel, which is good. Uh, in terms of test suites, uh, the main three that I'm that I kind of pay attention to are LTP Linux Test Project. They just had a release this last January. Uh, a lot of new tests for a, a bunch of uh, syscalls. Some of these are old syscalls, but they're still testing, you know, kind of corner cases and stuff. And then fixes for a lot of their tests. A lot of the tests in LTP have been broken for a long time, and they they've been fixing the stuff up, so it's really good. Um, and then they have some features, some new features uh, to make their test executor smarter. Uh, it's called metadata parser. They're they're kind of taking steps to to uh, kind of a new way to run the test that's more intelligent. Uh, anyway, you can look at the the notes for this release at that link there. And then KSELF test, uh, there's just a bunch of new tests. So this is really taking off in terms of um, systems that are using this. Uh, it's just incrementally adding more and more tests, which is good. Um, and then KUnit uh, also is being used a lot. Uh, some of the stuff that I kind of saw, I don't run KUnit myself that much. Uh, it's kind of more for the maintainers of individual areas of the kernel. Uh, but uh, there was a documentation cleanup, uh, an output format cleanup, and this new ability to run under QMU. Um, and then uh, I have to mention this. This is my kind of thing that I've been working on. Uh, board farm APIs. So uh, Sony, that's me, and TimeSys uh, have been proposing to standardize some board farm and hardware testing APIs. Uh, and we actually, this has been going on for over a year now, probably coming up on two years. Uh, but we proposed some new APIs at ELC 2021 uh, having to do with power measurement, camera and video, and serial port testing. Um, and uh, so I thought it was interesting at the same conference, uh, Pengutronics in, introduced a new multifunction uh, device under test control board. So they're doing board farm stuff. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people still working on hardware for board farms and APIs. Well, as far as I know, TimeSys and Sony are the only ones working on it, on like kind of trying to standardize an API. Uh, but if you're interested in that at all, there's some resources there. Uh, in terms of tool chain, we've got GCC. 
Uh, 11.2 was released in July, and I actually don't think there's been a new one released since then. Uh, and then LLVM 13.0 uh, was released in October. So some new tool chains and I didn't have time to list all the, the changes, but you can go see the release notes for these and, and see if there's something you want to upgrade to. <clears throat> so now in terms of conferences, um, I will talk a little bit about past conferences from 2021 and a little bit about future conferences. So embedded Linux conference in 2021 was held in September. And uh, this last year due to COVID, uh, we were going to have, uh, you know, we were expecting to have a standard uh, a year where we had uh, ELC North America and an ELC Europe. Uh, but because of the way things shook out, we ended up only having one of them and we combined it and we just called it ELC. I guess it was just worldwide ELC I had to combine in a single event in September. So we kind of split the difference sometime anyway. It was earlier than ELC Europe would have been and later than ELC North America would have been. Uh, it was challenging, though. This is the first hybrid event, uh, and it, it turned out that not as many people as we thought would attend attended. So there were still travel restrictions. Uh, and and what the worst thing, in my opinion, was that we only had a few talks on site. I think out of a 40, uh, oh, I like out of, 48 talks, only six were on site, which was which was bad. That was a pretty bad showing. Um, and it was it was not anybody's fault. It was, you know, when we had the CFP, people said that they planned to come uh, or, you know, I think at least half of the speakers said that they were planning on coming. But just things things just turned out that way due to the pandemic. Still, there's a lot of good content and we have gathered up all the slides and the videos with couple of exceptions. There's always a few speakers who don't submit their slides, um, but uh, those are all linked from that page. So <clears throat> the other event uh, that I wanted to talk about was uh, Open Source Summit Japan was just held in December. So that's pretty recently. And the slides and the video playlist are all online. And I actually looked, went and looked at a, a couple of the talks. Um, in, in particular, I was interested in some of the automated testing talks and uh, there looked like some real good material there. So um, so that's a resource that's available to you. Uh, coming up in 2022, we have Embedded Linux Conference North America uh, coming up in June uh, 22nd through the 24th in Austin, Texas, uh, if you're going in person, but this will also be a hybrid event. The CFP is open now, so if you want to submit a talk, uh, please do so. Please submit a proposal. Uh, we're very interested in, uh, in what you're working on. And then we're Embedded Linux Conference Europe, uh, September 13th through 16th in Dublin, Ireland. This will be the third time we try to go to Ireland. Uh, third time's a charm. Uh, <clears throat> again, this will also be a hybrid event. So it's really hard to tell uh, whether, you know, you, do, you just don't know what's going to happen with COVID-19. And so ELC 2021 was supposed to be the, was the first person event uh, held by the Linux Foundation, well, part of the Open Source Summit, which is the first event. Things looked like they would open up, but then they didn't. So the pandemic continued to cause problems for us for conferences in 2021. So I think we're going to be in this hybrid style for many months, uh, and we are still learning how to handle hybrid events. There were there were things that went OK in Seattle, but things we definitely we had a lot of talks with people who came in person and also people who attended online uh, about changes we could make to make it uh, more effective. And so we'll be implementing those as, as we can in the future. <clears throat> Just one comment on Open Source Summit. So this is becoming an umbrella event. Instead of kind of its own event, um, it is kind of an umbrella under which multiple events. In, case, in the case of Austin, there's going to be 13 sub-events, all these different events. Uh, everybody wants to get together. Um, and meet about stuff. There's, you notice there's a lot of security stuff there. There's, uh, there's, there's all kinds of different topics. Um, OK, so industry news. I am getting close to the end here. So just in terms of trade associations, well, I'm, I'm close enough. I'll go a little bit more quickly here. Linux Foundation is doing really well. They've had a lot of training. They, their training revenue tended to make up. They had, you know, just because of COVID, they did have a pretty big loss of um, of their uh, event revenue, conference revenue. 
they're just releasing a new suite of tools for managing projects. Um, and you can go look at those at lfx.dev. And they issued in December, they issued their annual report. So a lot of information, interesting information in that. Uh, this is the stats that actually came directly from the LFX dashboard. This talks, uh, this tracks all of the different repositories of the different projects. So there's a ton. The, the, the number of repositories and projects that are under the purview of the Linux Foundation is absolutely amazing. Absolutely staggering. There's no other uh, trade association, no other, no other um, organization really in the world that is managing or involved with the infrastructure for this much code. Uh, so they really are the, the premier organization that's managing open source. Um, of course, there are projects outside of the Linux Foundation that are that are not managed. But I mean, in terms of uh, ones that are managed by a single organization or that are kind of related to a single organization, uh, Linux Foundation is really the biggest one. Just a couple of uh, initiatives with interesting re uh, activities. And I am in the interest of time going to skip over these uh, Linux Foundation research. I'll just say that this is a this is a project to to create a lot of uh, go out and do surveys and reports. And they've done some interesting ones recently, SBOM and Sire Security, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, the Open Source Security Foundation. This is not a new foundation, but they've really kind of started to hit their stride. They've got a lot of initiatives to try and improve security and open source projects. Uh, they have some standards that they've already published, and they have already have some free online training and guides. So they have a OSS vulnerability guide. Uh, and they have free online uh, security software development courses. Uh, so that's uh, it's not uh, that should be secure software development, not security. But anyway, um, and then the Internet Research Group is another one that uh, uh, again involved with security. So security is a really hot topic this year because of the because of the vulnerabilities we've seen recently. But these guys operate Let's Encrypt, which provides a lot of the uh, certificates used for SSL. Um, Prosimo and Prio are some some of their other activities they're doing. Um, and that's because of this, uh, the pull kit security vulnerability, log4j, and something called solar winds. Um, I already talked about this one. This this is a, a vulnerability that has to do with a pull kit being set UID and not handling the case where it was passed with where it was started with no arguments. And uh, so Polkit always assumed that it, there was an argv and it started processing an argv1. So it assumed there was a first argument, so it always started at, at the second argument. Well, it turns out that because of that assumption, uh, this allowed attackers to inject items from the environment because it turns out the next thing right after the argument list is the environment. So uh, you could force Polkit to, uh, to treat things from the environment as if they were part of the command line. And uh, POSIX is ambiguous about this. It's an easy thing to fix. Uh, you can change the permissions on something called user bin PK exec to remove the set UID bit. Uh, but there's also a kernel fix in the works for this, just to disallow this argc equals zero. It's an old bug, and someone had submitted a patch for it 12 years ago, but the patch was not accepted. So that is a little bit disappointing. Uh, but anyway, so that's something that's going on. Log4j was a much bigger issue and a much more uh, much more severe bug and a much more uh, painful thing. So on, on the pull kit one, you had to be on the machine in order to, uh, you had to be able to execute the binary on the machine. This one, you just had to be using the service. And uh, it, it's a Java logging library used by over 30,000 projects. Uh, and it turns out that the uh, user could create the vulnerability just by altering what they passed in as part of the logging string. The logging string included elements that were provided by the user, and those would actually get executed and could redirect the system to start calling things uh, that were provided by an attacker. Uh, the fix to log4j was not that complicated. <clears throat> it's a pretty easy fix, but the real problem here was that the way log4j is embedded in projects, it's, it wasn't a simple dependency. It's you, It was usually embedded deep inside other projects, and so it was very difficult for server administrators to detect if they were affected and fix it. 
So we need a lot better methods to track component dependencies and better security audits and all that stuff. Um, the new the new buzzword for supply chain security is SBOMS. You're going to hear that a lot. So SBOMS is a software bill of material, and this is a way to track and validate source software as it moves through the supply chain. Uh, Solar Winds was a, a very a uh, disturbing attack on the U.S. government and many large companies in the U.S. And so uh, SBOMS is the response to that. Software Build Materials is supposed to help cure that. And the Linux Foundation has a whole project, automated uh, compliance tooling uh, project that deals with SBOMS and is hopefully for that. There was even a, a summit at the White House on this. So the Linux Foundation was invited to attend an open source security summit at the White House. And we discussed security issues and uh, OSS in the supply chain. They presented best practices from the Open Source Security Foundation. And uh, many important companies and groups were in attendance. And in fact, Google e even issued a statement uh, talking about the possibility of having the public or the government uh, invest in OSS security. So not just private companies or foundations, but to have the government involvement to fund and provide resources and, and assistance to create help security. OK, so I'm getting to the end here. So uh, just these are just a couple of interesting embedded Linux uses that I happen to see. So I always keep my eye on the number of Starlink satellites in orbit. Uh, as of January 10th, there were 1,552 Starlink satellites. Each of those has over six, uh, <clears throat> well, has at least 65 nodes of Linux because they have all this fault tolerance that's due to node replication. Um, and so there's 74,000 Linux nodes in low Earth orbit. So uh, I liked my joke here is that Skynet, which is the uh, Terminator uh, network that becomes self-aware, it's under construction and we've got a good start on it. Um, Greg K. Crow Hartman uh, did some embedded Linux programming where he he made it so that his Linux stable release would show up on this uh, mechanical signboard, which I thought was pretty funny. So it run, I don't know how often it runs, but you can if you go to this Twitter thing, you can see see it spin up. It's like uh, one of those old air, airline uh, flight boards, uh, but it's pretty funny. Um, and then the Mars helicopter. We have to talk about the Mars helicopter. I, so I went into great detail on the hardware and software for this last time. I just want to give an update. So it landed on February 21, um, and uh, it, it was supposed to do five flights. And uh, and then they were going to say, hooray, we did it. Uh, but it's still flying. It's already performed 18 flights so far. Um, there were some bugs encountered. This is interesting. So uh, the types of bugs you get, uh, you know, you, <laughs> no matter how careful you are. And I mean, they spent millions of dollars testing this and running all the scenarios. but. Uh, on flight number four, uh, their first attempt, they had a failure to transition to flight mode uh, because it, they had a watchdog timer expire because there was this delay transitioning transitioning between modes. So uh, the watchdog did what it was supposed to do, which was stop, stop. If, if it detected some anomaly, things took longer than expected. It was supposed to shut the system down. But in this case, it should have waited a little bit longer. Um, and then flight number six, they had some real big problems that almost caused it to crash. Uh, they had a navigation timestamp issue. So the hel helicopter flight was very wobbly and unstable. It rocked back and forth during flight. And this was because uh, they had a frame dropped. Uh, one single video frame dropped and caused all their timestamps to be off. And that seems like a kind of a rookie mistake, but you never know, right? So anyway, this caused problems for navigation. And, you know, as the, as the helicopter was uh, trying to compensate for that, miss those wrong timestamps, it caused it to act wonky. Uh, the uh, issues have received software updates. So they've done software updates on Mars. So this is where it is right now. Um, it's way far away from the rover. So the rover kind of went around this valley area and is over on the left side there. And the, the helicopter flew around and looked at some stuff on the left side. And then it has started to fly back to the right side. It's actually returning to uh, where it first started. And the reason for that is the rover, as soon as it's done with its science there, it's going to come back around and then they're both going to go up to a whole new area uh, up farther up the delta. Anyway, just kind of interesting. This was a mission that was supposed to, even when they even when they changed the parameters and said, well, we're going to go to an operations demonstration, 
not just a tech demo. They said, well, we're only going to go to 2021 or to August. But they it survived the Martian change of seasons. It went through winter and summer. In summer atmospheric conditions, the air is a little bit thinner, and they're worried it was not going to have enough lift. Uh, right now, there's no there's no deadline. They're continuing to do stuff. They're going to continue to use it as a scout for items of interest for the rover. Um, and in January, they were supposed to do Flight 19, but it was delayed due to a Mars dust storm. And this is the first time a flight was delayed due to bad weather on another planet. I thought that was really funny. Um, but really neat. So we're doing things the first time ever. Uh, here's, oh, I just have to plug this. So at ELC Europe or at ELC 2021 uh, this year, the uh, leader of this project, Tim Canham, gave and gave a great keynote address at um, at, Linux, at the conference. Uh, lots of super interesting stuff about the hardware, about the software, uh, you know, and how, how it works and what the problems they encountered and, you know, what the CPU utilization is and how they solve certain problems. Really interesting stuff. Uh, so definitely go check, check that out if you're interested. Okay, so in terms of resources, I get my stuff from LWN.net and Veronix, and especially from uh, Embedded Linux Conference presentations and, of course, Google and news sites. And so if you are not subscribed to Linux, LWN.net, please do so. Uh, it's a great resource for the community. Some of the content in this presentation is really recent, and so you may not be able to see it for uh, a week or two. Uh, but uh, if you hit that notice that you're not a subscriber and uh, and that's only available to subscribers, you can either wait two weeks or uh, even better, go subscribe. Uh, just pay a little bit of money and support that resource. Anyway, that's that's all I have for my presentation. So I hope I haven't gone too fast. I hope it was interesting to people and uh, I'm ready to take questions. If anybody has any questions. Yes, please go ahead to uh, ask any questions. I'm muted by yourself. Rob, go ahead. Um, yes, I asked in the chat earlier, you were talking about sweeping spin locks. How do they differ from semaphores? Actually, I believe so. I should have Frank. Uh, Frank, are you on the call? Anyway, Frank should answer this. But I believe what happens is they turn spin locks into semaphores, um, and then I don't know what the difference is between old semaphores and and these preemptible semaphores. Um, I think that there's some extra priority inheritance stuff they have to do. Uh, but I, it, my understanding is, and this is super old understanding because I did. I'm wasn't one of the like. I wasn't super involved with uh, the real-time patch set, uh, but my uh, my understanding is that they they turn every spin lock site into a semaphore, and then they have some extra logic to make it preemptible, um, and ha they have to deal with priority inheritance rights because you know now now they're allowing things to run which they weren't allowing before. But part of the reason that they didn't use semaphores before is the cache poisoning. If you start running some other code, the latency of the spin lock gets can be very high because you've evicted a bunch of cache lines. Is is there is there a page discussing this? The the trade offs? Um, I don't. There is a real time wiki. Um, and there's been a number of presentations over the years. Actually, this is. But the issue that you raise, which is uh, cache poisoning, that is really interesting. And I'm sure that that's an issue uh, in terms of performance, right? Because and overall performance is uh, one of the most important things when you're doing real time, right? Is you can't you can't gain preemptibility, but then lose all your performance due to cache issues. Um, and cache issues can cause up to, you know, 200 times uh, higher delays. Uh, you know, just due to caching effects than than you would see if you're doing straight line code. So, but I'm not aware of uh, I'm not aware of any specific resource. So that's a great question. OK, thank you. Yeah. And Frank and Daniel gave some comment upon that. In the oh, 
I should get to the where I can see the uh, chat. OK. Any question other, by other, other people? Is it really OK? So Rod, I have to comment on this one. Rob <laughs> Lansley says, blame Matt Damon for bad Martian weather. That's a great, that's a great, that's a great comment. So if you've seen the movie The Martian, uh, that's really funny. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I think, uh, well, in the book, a sandstorm, uh, a dust storm actually is one of the plot points. He has to survive a, a dust storm. I don't remember, I can't remember if the movie included a dust storm, but. But dust storms are a thing on Mars, and apparently they will ground your helicopter. <laughs> it did. Um, the main scientific discrepancy in the movie The Martian is that it starts with a scientific. Oh, that's right. It starts. It starts with the dust storm. Well, there in the book, there is also a dust storm in the middle that he has to figure out how to survive through because he's relying on solar power. But I don't remember if they. I don't think. I don't remember if they included that that dust storm. So there are actually two dust storms in the book. Yeah, and, and yeah, and in the well, anyway, we I could go on and on about Martian. One of my favorite books, and uh, and one of my favorite movies. So, so and maybe you could tell from my content that I'm kind of Mars fascinated. <laughs> okay, maybe the uh, Linux community is now getting to be some of the astron 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 astronaut, but anyway. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, okay. We'd like to continue just this jamboree. And everybody, okay? Yep. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. It's all. So.